Uh, I'll try to, to give a little bit of a, an intro about exoplanets so that the, the non-astronomers can, can follow along. And then I'll describe some of the early work we've been doing on trying to apply machine learning to be able to improve the detection uh, capabilities of the next generation of exoplanet surveys. I should, should thank many collaborators, including Zhao Go, who's here, as well as uh, some of the grad students I'll, I'll mention throughout the talk. Uh, and then, of course, the, the larger teams that are involved in, uh, in, the, in these projects. So this morning, Mike told us about his efforts to search nearly the entire sky for one possible planet. Uh, an alternative approach is to stare at one patch of sky for, for several years and look for a few hundred thousand possible planets. And when we do that, what we're, we're doing is watching the brightness of each star and waiting for a planet to just happen to pass in front of its star, cast its shadow over the Earth, and we observe the star decrease in brightness. For Jupiter, that'd be about a 1% effect, relatively easy. A good as amateur astronomer could, could do it for many stars in their backyard. For an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star, it takes a NASA mission, a uh, one meter class telescope, being able to measure the brightness of a star to within one part in 10 to the 4. It is the size that the signal introduced by Earth passing in front of the sun. So that's challenging, um, but the Kepler mission was able to, to do this quite well. And as a result, it's found a few, uh, few thousand extrasolar planet candidates. And Individually, uh, some of them are very interesting, and we heard about some of them yesterday. Uh, but as a population, we can then ask the question, how common are different types of planets? Um, and, and so this diagram is sort of preliminary results from Dan Lee Su, one of the uh, graduate students in our research group, trying to, to use these generative models that model the Kepler detect mission, its detection pipeline, that model the intrinsic population of extrasolar planets, combine those, and in this case, they're using uh, approximate Bayesian computation and sequential importance sampling to, to sort of learn the intrinsic distribution of planets. A sort of classical statistical inference problem, relatively uh, straightforward, but computationally uh, challenging because of all the uh, sort of details of the problem. And so we get sort of a frequency of planets at different sizes, and that's very nice. Um, but the best part of Kepler was not figuring out the frequency of planets, but rather it turns out that there's all these planetary systems. Most of the planets we know of are now not an individual one planet or one star, but a planetary system with multiple known transiting planets. And that's great because then we're able to study not just an individual planet size and orbital period, maybe its mass and density if we're lucky, uh, in a few cases a little bit about their atmospheres, but we're able to study the system and learn about the relationships between planets of different sizes and densities, get it, getting clues to how they form, such as we heard from Hilke yesterday. If we take that the model I showed you previously that had the frequency of planets as a function of planet size and orbital period and randomly combine planets together, we can then look at, are we able to reproduce the observed distribution of things such as orbital periods or planet size distribution? And the answer is yes. But then, if instead we ask questions about the distribution of period ratios of planets within one system or of radius ratios within one system, we see that the, the observations um, here in, in gray and the, the model here in black do not agree. And so what this says is that planet formation is not making individual planets that don't know anything about each other, but rather there's a planetary system and the properties of planets in the same system are correlated. Now as a, a dynamicist, that's not particularly surprising, but the fact that it's so significant it's observed means that now I can start to use that to learn about the planet formation process. And so uh, we've been working on develop, going from uh, simple models where you have independent planets drawn in each system to using things such as a, a clustered point process to be able to uh, model the correlations in planet sizes and separations so that instead of modeling the frequency of planets, we're now beginning to model the frequency of planetary systems. And so this work that uh, Matthias had, one of the graduate students uh, at Penn State, has been uh, working on and, and will be doing some, some papers on hopefully this year. Um, and one of the things that people here might be interested in, I was just talking to Mike about, is that the, the calculations, they're not ridiculous, but they are expensive. And the exploring the parameter space, it's a 12, 13 dimensional parameter space. It's an annoying parameter space to explore. Um, so instead of trying to uh, use the model directly, what we've resorted to doing is, is building a Gaussian process emulator for our, our, our function, our, our model. And here, I just, you know, sort of one thing to illustrate what, what we've been doing is looking at if we train our model to predict, in this case, a distance function between the uh, observed Kepler population of planets and our simulated population of planets and compare those two, 
we can see that our, our sort of first principles model, where we model little details in the pipeline, the intrinsic po population of planetary systems uh, shown in blue, and then compare it to uh, a data set, or I guess, I guess the blue is the training data set. We're comparing the, the prediction uh, from, from the model to the, the emulator. We can see that we're able to, to do a good job of predicting the, the, how the model would behave without actually running the full model. And this then opens up the possibility of applying more computationally expensive inference methods to a, a model that's a little bit sophisticated and time consuming. So, so now we're beginning to learn things not just about individual planets, but about planetary systems. But the problem is the Kepler mission detected planets via transit. So it relied on the planet passing in front of us. So that's a geometric effect, and the probability decreases the further and further you go. And so if we want to study planets at 1 AU, well, already that's quite hard. And Kepler mission was just barely sort of getting to probe Earth-sized planets at 1 AU. If we want to study planets at 5 AU, like Jupiter, or yikes, 300 AU, uh, we need some other methods to help. And so uh, the, the, the other method that has been very productive in uh, finding exoplanets, it, it, I mean, there's been several methods that have been very valuable, but the other sort of dominant method in terms of just planet count, and the one that's particularly relevant for exoplanet follow-up is, is radial velocity method. So in the early days of exoplanets, the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of the planets were discovered um, using a different method, where instead of having a, a single small telescope look at a lot of stars, you picked one big telescope, and you looked at one star at a time, and you made precise measurements to recognize the star's velocity changing. And the orbital motion of the planet induces a, a wobble of the star, measure a Doppler effect. And so in the early days, the, these, uh, these radial velocity surveys, they were designed to recognize a Doppler shift that's sort of just a simple shift of the spectrum, a centroid motion. And they chose things such as the resolution of their spectrographs, the signal to noise they observed at, to detect those levels of effects. But the new generation of instruments, uh, such as the Newton instrument uh, and HPF being built at Penn State, but also Express being built at Yale and Expresso going uh, already in uh, South America, Chile, and, and other ones as well, Spiru, and uh, they're building the instruments not just to detect Doppler effects, but rather to detect changes in the stellar spectrum. And so we're sort of approaching an era where we have to worry about additional uh, effects. And to appreciate how challenging this is, uh, here's a, a solar spectrum. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, so this is meant to, to look like what a solar spectrum might look like uh, on a shell spectrograph. So if you look at each uh, row here, it's sort of one little range of wavelengths. And as you go left to right on one side, you go from red to blue. And a typical shell spectrograph might have something like maybe 70 orders, so 70 rows, and, and several thousand pixels across on each row. And then you see the spectral lines of the star, these dark regions, for, to, to make it pretty. We've colorized it so it, it you know, <laughs> looks more interesting than black and white on your detector. But, but the key thing is the early detectors were built to only include uh, spectral coverage in regions where it was good to make the measurements. The stars were relatively well behaved. Um, but the new generation of spectrographs are intentionally looking at broader ranges of wavelengths so that they'll get additional information about the stellar behavior. And so there's going to be new opportunities to, to measure things that before have been inaccessible to us. Now, the, the sort of Doppler signatures are, are annoyingly small. So you know, for, for illustration purposes, here we make it move by enough that you can see it from the audience. But in real life, we're talking about motions of less than 1 100th of a pixel. And so from any one spectral line, there's no way you could recognize that this spectral line shifted by less than 1 100th of a pixel. But we don't just have one spectral line. We have an entire spectrum, thousands of spectral lines. And some of those spectral lines are, are nice, clean ones. Some are kind of dirty, have multiple lines blended together. Some of them are in regions of the spectrum where there's telluric uh, variability. And so it's uh, a challenging problem to be able to, to convert these spectra into measurements of the star's velocity. In the old days, astronomers literally took plates, slid them back and forth to compute a cross-correlation function of where they lined up. And this was a great method back when you had photographic plates. And then we got digital computers, and we digitized the method of sliding the spectra back and forth until they lined up. And, and amazingly, lots of the current uh, pipelines are still based on the fundamental principle of, let's try sliding spectra back and forth until they line up, despite the fact that now we can use a much more uh, sort of principled analysis method. And, and so this really sort of uh, caused us to step back for a moment and ask the question, well, what are we trying to do? What does it mean to detect a planet? 
And, and back in the, the late 90s, people took a, a frequentist approach of saying, well, let's assume the star doesn't have a planet, and we'll observe it. And if we can show that that's a ridiculous explanation of our data, then we, we've rejected that null hypothesis. Oh, clearly there must be some planet explaining the data. Um, and, and that worked for a while because we were looking for, at signals so big, not to diminish all the hard work of the instrumentationalists who, who built the instruments, but nevertheless there's a big effect, much larger than say the stellar variability, that that was sort of the only option, at least for, for the well-behaved stars, that once you saw a large radio velocity signature in the right range of periods and you had done a little bit of research on your star, that was a, a safe sort of logical train. Um, but, but today we're sort of shifting to a, a Bayesian approach where we have to say, well, actually, every star is variable at the level we're observing it. And so, of course, the star is changing. That that's, doesn't tell you anything about that. The key is, are the changes we see distinct enough to distinguish stellar variability from the signature of a planet? And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the methods we're trying to do to be able to... Uh, to, to, to recognize those two things. And so what you have to do is you have to say, well, actually, as physicists, we know a lot about what a Doppler shift looks like. So instead of uh, having a very general model for something complicated like a star surface where you have convection and pulsations and granulation patterns uh, and very complicated physics that maybe some people could try to do a first principle simulation of one little patch of the star for a little bit of time at one range of wavelengths, well, that's not going to be able to be scaled up. And so one of the opportunities for using uh, some of the, the machine learning methods is on training models to our simulations to then allow us to simulate at a much larger scale in a statistically uh, useful way. And so if we compare sort of the early days of exoplanet discovery when planets had amplitudes that were much larger than measure uncertainties, where now the most interesting planets have amplitudes that are less than uh, the amplitude of a, a single measurement's uncertainty. That's certainly changing, you know, chi by i no longer works. Um, before, we used to, to worry primarily about photon noise. Their dominant source of noise was, well, how much uh, shot noise is there from just data collection. But, but now the new generation of instruments will basically always be limited not by photons, but by the stellar variability itself. And so as a result, we need to uh, ch change the way we do the analysis. Uh, previously, uh, we could say, well, the radio velocity model, that's, that's perfectly, you know, Newtonian gravity is one of the few things we're really confident about. But the challenge is now that most of the contamination is coming from stellar variability, now we have more of an empirical model for stellar activity and have to, to figure out how do we do inference with a model that we know is wrong. Uh, in the past, we had a, a relatively simple model. Uh, we could say, oh, well, each planet's described by a Keplerian orbit. Maybe there's seven parameters. Maybe because of projection effects, you get down to five. Um, a few maybe to model the instrument. But nevertheless, a small enough number of parameters that you could use traditional methods like MCMC, important sampling, to have a, a nice good characterization of, of things statistically. But now we're having to shift to model the stellar activity with non-parametric models that, that are both uh, more challenging, but also more challenging for us to interpret. And so we have to be more careful in, in not just doing the first thing that comes to mind, but in validating and, and verifying that models are applicable and do what we want. And so when, when I talk to uh, observers, uh, what I try to convince them is, traditionally they thought very hard about building their instrument and taking their observations, uh, turning those uh, photons into to starlight, and then they sort of jump directly to their planets. And now there's sort of this new link of the, the, the image processing, but also the statistical inference that sometimes can be quite computationally that's going to be required to teach us about the individual planets. And then we want to have that feedback to inform the design of our future studies. And so it's really a sort of a, a virtuous cycle of learning about the universe, feeding back on our design of the next set of instruments. So as I call these sort of the, the four pillars of, of exoplanet discovery, you have to have a little bit of fundamental physics, knowing about the reflex motion of stars through the Doppler shift, as well as the way stellar variability can imprint itself on the spectrum. You, you need telescope time. I mean, the, 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 the amount of information we need to extract is increasing. And so whereas in the old days we might have been happy with a few dozen observations, I think increasingly we're going to find ourselves using over 100 observations per star because we need to characterize each star's individual variability patterns. 
Of course, we need the instrumentation to be able to, to collect the starlight. And, and it's really impressive the things that some of my, my friends over in the instrumentation side are doing now to be able to, to have a process where we can make a nice statistical model to, to really understand the data collection process. And, and there's always some details that are a little bit annoying, but I think we can go a lot closer to the data than we have been in the past. And then at the very end, then we get to interpret that model in sort of a scientifically uh, responsible way thanks to some of the advances in statistical and computing methods. OK, so with that introduction, um, I've said a little about the challenge uh, of what we want to do to discover these plants in the midst of, or characterize plants in the midst of cellular variability. Um, and then I'll talk a little about the opportunities that I see, and then two different types of learning. One in terms of the, the wavelength domain, so looking at each specter individually, what can we learn? And the other in the time domain, how can we use temporal variability to help us? So the challenge is that stars are not perfect light bulbs. So previously, we basically assumed that each star was a perfect light source, and we could treat it as such. But in fact, the most obvious thing might be star spots. You can sort of imagine that as a, a dark region of the star rotates into view, it's decreasing the amount of starlight that's rotating towards you. So now it looks like the star is going, uh, it's going away from you, right? Because you're losing some light coming towards you. And then as it rotates it across the disk of the star, once in the center of the disk, well, now it's sort of symmetric. So now the, the velocity perturbation is gone, but the photometric effect is there. It rotates off the disk. And so that's the, the easy one, but there's also other effects. So oftentimes, actually, these bright regions, even though they're not as concentrated, can make just as big or a larger effect in the solar spectrum. If they're due to, to uprising hot gas that's then falling down in sort of interesting little cellular patterns uh, with very low Prandtl numbers, makes it hard for the MHD folks to simulate. And so, so that's the challenge. Um, and, and what are we going to do about that? Well, um, I don't quite understand this pointer. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. OK, so we have this spectrum here. And at, through your eye, you kind of see the big spectral bands moving around. But with these new instruments, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on what used to be a, a small chunk of the spectrum that, that maybe was sort of analyzed as one little batch and just try to, to measure a mean and a variance for how much of a shift is used in this region. But we can look at, at that region of the spectrum and try to understand as the, the stellar surface rotates and say a, a spot goes across the surface, the shapes of those lines will change. The, the depths of the lines change, the skewness, the, the ratio of the, the absorption of the wings, the absorption of the line, all those things will change. And so we want to, to be able to combine our understanding that a, a true Doppler shift changes the spectrum in a very distinct way. Right? And so we can recognize that if I have this spectrum and I make a small Doppler shift, well then it's just adding a perturbation that some scalar times this pattern. And that's that's what a Doppler shift is. And then we can say, OK, well, now that we've taken out what looks like a Doppler shift, and what looks like a Doppler shift isn't just a Doppler shift. There's the real Doppler shift, and there's the parent Doppler shift. But then we can look at what's left using machine learning and figure out from this little region of the spectrum, there's a, a few stellar lines. It's not obvious to me, but this one evidently has a, a sort of depth to wing ratio that's very indicative of how much stellar activity there is in this case. And these other lines, not so much. Right? So some are hardly anything. Sometimes a, a shallower line turns out to have more of an effect. So it's not always obvious. Now, maybe a really good stellar astronomer could go through and go, oh, magnesium 2, let's see. And they could think about it. And they could tell me which ones are likely magnetically active. But the problem is all their great insight is built on spatially resolved imaging of the sun. And so while it's, it's fun, and I mean, I'm going to show you, pretend like we're analyzing data in the sun, because that's what we can do well in test. The real, the real test is taking these to other stars. And so as the, the temperature of the star changes, or the metallicity changes, we need to have a method that isn't just sort of catered to where we have uh, enough domain expertise to say, create a, a labeled data set or to, to motivate a particular model, but to say we need a, a method that's able to take a star and learn how to recognize stellar activity in this star. And so the sun is certainly a valuable test case, but we want to make sure our methods are able to, to generalize to other stars as well. So, so how are we going to recognize the difference between stellar activity and uh, planets? Well, planets have many nice properties. Um, basically, uh, uh, the planets interact with the star. The star interacts with the planets. Yes, there's some very interesting planet-planet interactions. And, and you know, if you get me outside, I'd love to talk about those. Those are very interesting. But for this talk, the planets basically are just interacting with the sun. And so they have a coherent orbital pattern, constant period, constant phase, constant amplitude. And that is a unique signature that's very different from what happens when you have stellar activity or granulation patterns that do not have coherence over long time scales. 
And so we want to be able to, to compare the, the evidence for signals that are coherent versus ones that are only quasi-periodic and have variations in their, their strengths uh, as a function of time. Uh, additionally, I mentioned the Doppler shift is strictly a shift of the spectrum, whereas stellar variability we saw can change the line shapes. And another thing that's, that's sort of a, just above but it's uh, particularly powerful is the Doppler shift affects the entire spectrum the same way, whereas other effects vary either from line to line or just say from the red side of your spectrum to the blue side of the spectrum. And so we can look for things sort of analyzing groups of data at a time and ask, do they all give us the same answer or do different regions of the spectrum uh, give us different signatures? And that would be more likely due to uh, activity. So sometimes it's useful to sort of divide these two things into two regions. In principle, there's one humongous problem, and maybe someone's clever enough to come up with a computationally efficient way to solve it all at once. If that's you, please get in touch. Uh, I'm sure me or David Hogg would be delighted to sort of learn about those. But, but so far, we've taken the approach to try to se separate those two things in two phases and say, OK, we have a, a few million pixels in each spectrum. We can try to learn in the wavelength domain where we take off the temporal labels and just try to understand what does variability do to the star. And once we've learned what the signature of variability looks like, then we can put it into a temporal model and say, now we can perform a dimensional reduction on our data, pick out a few uh, indicators of what the star is doing, and look for temporal patterns in that with a, a sort of learning in the time domain. So that, that's sort of going to be the basic uh, strategy we ha have. And, and this sort of has a philosophy, uh, I think, similar to what you may have heard on, on Wednesday, where we want to incorporate the physics that we can. We don't want to make the machine learn everything. When we need to, say when there's something complicated we don't understand, like stellar uh, variability due to MHD turbulence in a, a low parental number medium, well then we want to pull out our machine learning tools. But in order to, to make a claim of a planet, we need to make sure that we, we know what we're doing. Because it's not just the, the solar system people who have a bad rep for finding planets that aren't there. Uh, you know, we, we've had a few embarrassing episodes of our own where someone applied some fancy method, they claim they found a whole bunch of planets, then later it turns out they're not there. Oh, maybe they were, their period's just wrong. And, and it's a big mess. And, and what, what I think is, you know, there, there's some fields of science that have uh, very important applications to, to the world and also very big conflicts of interest. And you can see how people might be misled. This is exoplanets. There's basically no application to our life. There's no politics that's going to affect us. If scientists can't figure out how to reliably detect planets, when we have no like, incentives of climate or energy or something like that, medicine, how can, how can the public trust us or our colleagues in other fields to be able to make valid inferences? And so I think it's really important that we sort of develop a, a high standard for ourselves to be able to say, yes, we're going to try to do the best we can. We're going to push the limits. But we're also going to have a sort of solid statistical foundation so that when we make claims, we can assess, oh, it's 0.2% probability that this is a real planet, or not a real planet, hopefully, <laughs> um, as opposed to, to just sort of going, oh, it's a pattern. It looks like a planet. I'm not sure what's really happening. And so I think it's uh, being able to connect our machine learning to a statistical model is very important to me. Um, another thing that uh, sort of says maybe the physicist in me is it's a big, complicated problem. And maybe some people would try to, to do the entire problem at once. Uh, the approach I'm going to take is going to start with very simple tests. Tests that on one hand, you can point out why they're simplified and, and why they're not representative of everything about the real world. But on the other hand, even these simple tests, we could have failed miserably. Right? It could have been the methods we tried were not useful even on these simple cases. And so we're going to start simple, build up complexity with time, try to understand not just does the model work, but why does it work, and use that to develop a, a pipeline that we're able to uh, have algorithms that are able to make reliable and interesting planet discoveries. OK, so, so what do we do? Um, well, what we do is we take stellar spectra, and then we, uh, uh, not, that's, we spatially resolve stellar spectra. So there's, for the sun, you can see the disk. You can zoom out a little region, take a spectrum, a, a quiet region, an active region, a spot region. And you can take those spectra and then linearly combine them to make up what the spectrum of the sun might look like if there were a certain spot pattern. And so we can make lots of synthetic uh, spectra for the sun based on real data that include the complicated MHD physics, but have taken out the sort of interesting uh, time, time component of it. And so here I'm going to show results where I just have one spot rotate across the star. So on one hand, very simplified. On the other hand, the spectra is still quite rich. And then what we do is, from the simulated spectra, we try to, to teach the machine how to recognize which of these features are due to, to activity. 
The first step was just to ask the question, is there enough information to make this practical? And so we just something really simple. We took a bunch of spectra, did PCA, and tried to ask, if I took, put in realistic resolution signal to noise the next generation instruments, could I extract more than one principal component? It could have been the answer was no. And indeed, we found that some of the resolutions and signal to noises that astronomers are taking you couldn't recognize stellar activity as being distinct from Doppler shift because the signal was only sufficient to get out one principal component, basically the Doppler shift. Um, and so then uh, we then looked at questions like how much signal to noise and resolution would you need? And the good news is, with the next generation of instruments and with increased d uh, attention to getting high signal to noise observations, it will be possible to measure two, maybe even three principal components representing the variability due to star spots and sunlight stars. And so that tells us, OK, there's enough information there. We can try to do something. The next task is to try to not just say there's some information, but how can we get useful information? And so the, the old approach astronomers took was they'd measure the Doppler shift, and then they'd go and take their favorite region of the spectrum. Maybe there's a, a calcium line or a hydrogen line. They go, let's, let's study that line and measure some stuff about it. And they kind of knew from studying active stars that some lines were, were useful indicators of whether or not the star had large photometric variability. And so they, they might call them uh, magnetically sensitive lines or active uh, activity indicators. And they would pick these things that were astronomically easy to measure, but they weren't chosen to be good predictors of what the apparent radio velocity shift was. And they're not uncorrelated. So if you try to inference on a data set where you have things you measure that are all correlated with each other, it's very difficult. And so one of the, the key things we do is we say, let's take that spectrum. And the first thing we, well, not first. First, we do some basic data reduction, you know, flat feeling things. But once, once you get sort of uh, calibrated data out, the, the first step in sort of our inference process is saying, let's take out what a Doppler shift would look like. And now let's only study perturbations to the spectrum that are orthogonal to a Doppler shift. And what this means is anything we measure in what's left can, can be indicative of what that same activity is causing to perturb the actual star, giving an apparent radio velocity that's not zero. But the radio velocity signature can't cause any changes in the stellar activity indicators we measure. And so now that we sort of decoupled these two things, you know, it's very simple, but it also allows us to, to move forward statistically modeling these in a, in a much more uh, powerful way. So then we looked at once we apply these sorts of uh, simple projecting out the effect of a Doppler shift, then doing uh, basic sort of dimensional reduction, how many principal components or uh, independent components, diffusion maps are necessary to be able to reconstruct the spectra. And this is a case where our current model is limited. So with our limited assumptions, we can do really, really well. But that's largely effective. We've, we have a simplified model. And we fully expect that when we go to real data, we won't recover quite as much. Uh, and so then we'll have, perhaps, instead of finding that all the methods perform similarly, might have to devote more attention to which machine learning methods are, are most applicable for the particular types of signals we have. So once we've done that, we've taken each spectra, which might be a few million of uh, flux measurements, and turned them into just a, a few, few values. We have the time the data was taken, the apparent radial velocity shift, one to the three indicators, something about stellar activity from, from these uh, machine learning algorithms, and then some covariance matrix about the correlations between all those things we've measured. And so a planet can affect the apparent radio velocity shift, but nothing else. Stellar activity can affect everything we've measured. And so with that, we can now set up a, a, a model to do Bayesian inference on, where you say, OK, th this true velocity will have some, uh, some model that says, say, the, maybe the orbit of the planet or just the velocity of the star. And then whatever uh, perturbation to the apparent velocity that's due to stellar activity. And then we'll have the same Gaussian process also causing changes in the stellar activity. And there's a relationship because we're writing each activity indicator as a linear combination of the same underlying GP, but also its derivative and second derivative. And this is very important because if you think about it, well, when a, a dark region on the star rotates into view, well, at the edge, it's just sort of just coming into view and, and it causes a relatively modest flux effect, but a big RV effect. And then as it rotates the center of the disk, it causes a big RV effect, but, but not, sorry, a big flux effect. But because of symmetry, there's no velocity perturbation. And as it rotates off, it causes the same photometric effect as before, but the sign has reversed. And so some of those activity indicators, we recognize that, oh, there's a big spot, but we can't tell whether it's on the side rotating towards us or away from us. If we only use the activity indicators at that instant in time, we wouldn't be able to distinguish whether the perturbation was positive or negative. 
But by making use of the derivative information, we're able to figure out when is the activity causing present and causing apparent Doppler shift towards us, when is it present and causing a Doppler shift away from us. And so this uh, sort of this model, it was sort of a generalization of something that had been pr proposed uh, previously by other astronomers uh, like uh, Raj Paul and Igran. And then we said, okay, now let's compute uh, some covariance matrices. We have to dock functional forms for those. And so one of the areas that we're researching now is trying different uh, functional forms for these covariances to try to do, uh, I, if I wanted to be fancy, I could say we're trying to learn the kernel. In practice, we're just goofing around at this point. But one of the things we, we aspire to is to someday replace our uh, exploratory analysis with actual kernel learning. Um, so, so there's one aspect of saying we need to learn the relationships between these various stellar activity indicators and then use those so that when we have uh, some group of, of data, we can condition on that data and then be able to uh, figure out what the perturbations to the star are. So um, let's demonstrate that in some of this. Uh, we debate amongst ourselves whether you should call it real data or simulated. It's a little bit of each. So it's uh, taking, taking real data, processing it, and making it look like data if we were observing the sun uh, with a certain instrument. And so here we consider the express instrument being built uh, by Deborah Fisher groups at Yale. It's notable because it has one of the highest resolutions uh, currently under or, or currently operating. Um, and then we use uh, machine learning to construct the stellar activity indicators here, just using a simple PCA analysis. And then we, we plot as a function of time uh, the apparent radial velocity we measure for that star as a spot is on the, the back side of the star, rotates into view, rotates towards the center of the disk, rotates towards the other edge of the disk, rotates back behind the star. And you can see that the apparent radial velocity has this sort of uh, 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 seesaw or something pattern. Uh, the, the, one of the indicators that's good at recognizing the amount of activity uh, recognizes when it's at the center of the disk. And another one of the more difficult indicators to measure do, is able to, to distinguish whether it's on the uh, leading or, or trailing side. And you notice there's a gap here because we want to sort of test the algorithm and see how well does it do at, at figuring out what happened uh, during that gap. So after we simulate the observations, we, we add photon noise and, and put in realistic resolutions. And, and then we, we sort of make these measurements. And then we say, OK, well, now let's try uh, putting in a realistic observing pattern. So we're going to distribute, say, 100 observations over uh, a season or two of, of observation time, so a little bit more than a year, less than two years. And then we'll try to, to, to do this analysis of modeling simultaneously the activity indicators and the apparent radial velocity. It looks like a big mess because the, the, or, or the rotational period of the star is much less than the uh, time span of observations. And so there's uh, you know, just high frequency stuff that's confusing to your eye. If we phase it up, it looks a lot uh, easier to interpret to your eye. And once we do this, we can ask, how well can we detect planets in data sets like this? And so the data set I showed you, we injected a 1% by area spot that caused an apparent radial velocity of 7 meters per second. This is big. Right? So m most of the time, the sun's uh, spot activity causes just a, maybe 2 or 3 meters per second of activity. So a, a particularly big and annoying spot came through, and we asked, in the presence of that spot, could, how well can we detect planets with this uh, approach? Uh, we tried several approaches, uh, and what we found is some of these methods are able to find planets that are uh, basically you know, just a few percent of the, uh, the size of the spot in terms of their radial velocity signature. And so in principle, even with this uh, 7 meter per second uh, perturbation from the spot, we were able to find a 20 centimeter per second planet. My hope is that if we only have 2 or 3 meter per second signal from the star, we might be able to find a 10 centimeter per second planet, because that's an Earth or a sun-like star. There's a lot of there's sort of detection efficiency curves here. Why are there so many? Well, the, the gray curve shows what happens if you just use the, the traditional method, and it doesn't go up until off, off the wall. The, the green model shows uh, another approach that had used um, a similar sort of, in, in some ways, model, not quite as general, and picked their activity indicators based on astronomical intuition rather than machine learning. And then we tried several different models here. The different curves show the different things we tried. So uh, there, there's several models that do quite well. We can then study and ask, OK, well, there was this flexible model that had a lot of different coefficients. When we consider different models, we're set, choosing some coefficients to be active and setting some to be 0. Which coefficients need to be active for the model to do well? And we can basically figure out, OK, here's what's happening. This indicator is doing this, that, the other. And then we basically always have these uh, five indicators in any good model. And then maybe you add one more. Um, and it might help. It might not. It's hard to really tell. So, so in this case, what did, the, what did the machine learn? What did we actually accomplish? Well, we, we learned how to 
measure stellar activity indicators from a single spectrum, uh, or, or one spectrum at a time. There's an ensemble of spectrum, but from one spectrum we can measure the stellar activity indicators, and then how to model the temporal evolution of those activity indicators, including the apparent radial velocity jointly, so that we are able to then uh, distinguish a planetary signal from a stellar activity sig signal. Now to make that happen, we, we had to put things in. So we had to enforce that a Doppler shift has a particular functional form, that the planet follows a capillarian orbit, and those two things we want to keep. The two things we don't necessarily want to keep is, is we picked a, a model here. It seemed you know, reasonably flexible and interesting, but perhaps there's a better way to do this part. Similar, we picked one kernel. We took the thing someone else used in the literature. Uh, no exploration yet. So that's something that Christian uh, Gilbertson has been working on recently, is trying to uh, create data sets and then uh, the functionality so that we can rapidly explore many different kernels to try to uh, figure out which ones work well for realistic stellar activity patterns. So, so what's the, sort of the next steps? Well, uh, so far we, we've actually been reasonably successful with some pretty simple techniques. I fully expect that as we go to more realistic data, there'll be new challenges that we may have to, to branch out more. Uh, in particular, I think that the kernel right now, we, we didn't need anything fancy because we had such a simple stellar activity uh, signal in time. We're, we're now working on trying to improve the simulations in time so that we can compare performance of different kernels. Um, and so that basically gets down to making more realistic training and test data. And this is, this is a challenge because we only have really good data for the sun. We probably will never have spatially resolved high resolution spectra of another star, certainly in our lifetimes. So we have to figure out how do we do inference under these constrained circumstances. Um, this is so, so, so what Christian's been doing on sort of generating simulated uh, solar variability. Uh, sort of, you can recognize maybe uh, star spots coming and going uh, in the simulated time series. And this is what we're going to be using now to, to, to see how well we're able to choose kernels. And in some cases, you know, maybe this method will actually prove useful for finding Earth-like planets. That'd be wonderful. But even if this method itself doesn't prove useful because there's some implementation details, the computational cost, even with these simplified models, what we can do is say, how much observation time do you need to be able to distinguish a planet from stellar activity? And that's critically important because if you're an observer and you have so much telescope time, you have a choice. Do I observe 10 stars 1,000 times each? Or do I observe 1,000 stars 10 times each? Or something in the middle? If you observe 1,000 times 10 times each, 1,000 stars 10 times each, I can guarantee you, you won't find any low mass planets because you don't have enough data to make a strong inference. On the other hand, if you observe uh, 10 stars 1,000 times each, you might be in good shape, but you might get unlucky. With just 10 stars, there may be no Earths in, in your survey sample. And so they, um, they sort of drip pushed in both directions. And if we can find out what's required in order to confidently detect planets in simplified simulated data, we can be conf conf confident that in real data, we'll need at least that many observations. And, and so, e although I, I hope that this will prove to be a valuable tool, even if we aren't able to ultimately have a, you know, a computationally practical pipeline, I think it's still important that we do this type of preparatory research, just as you would do ray tracing for your instrument before you actually build the thing, you should do statistical analyses with your data before you start your survey. And so that's something I hope that certainly as we move towards very large space missions uh, that are going to be working towards imaging and taking spectra of our planets, that we'll think about those issues in advance uh, like we heard about yesterday. So I want to say some time for questions. So, so maybe I'll, I'll wrap up there and just uh, leave you for food for thought of how can we create uh, sort of an environment uh, for, for science and, and for the public of responsible and reproducible science in this exciting field of exoplanets.